At least I hope. So, let's go to the Lord. Father, we come to you this evening, Lord, hungry for your voice. Lord, for your word. Lord, we know that, um, that the word that you have given us, Father, that it is powerful. Father, that it is breathed by you uh, through the men that you chose to, to pen it, Father. And Lord, we pray that that God-breathed word in the scriptures that we're going to look at tonight would penetrate our hearts. Father, would become a part of who we are. Because Lord, we know when that happens that, that we are, are different after the experience, Father. Uh, so Lord, we pray that your voice would speak to us. Father, I pray that your voice rather than mine would speak to our hearts this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. So I was uh, pondering over what to teach tonight, because doing it every now and then, it's kind of like a flow, and don't want to tread on pastor, so what's he going to be teaching soon, and all of that, and I just kept coming back to what I had been teaching before, and uh, we had just finished 3 John, so I thought, well, what's next? since we go straight through. So tonight we're going to do the entire book of Job. No, not Job. That, that, that would have been a long one. <laughs> Change that to Jude, not Job. Um, man, we, I'd miss school tomorrow if we did that one straight through. Um, Jude is, is one of those one chapter wonder books. It is only one chapter long and that uh, chapter has only 25 verses, but Man, that guy packed a lot into that one little book. Uh, so, let's just uh, start with a little background. Jude was most likely, we, there, it's, it's, there's still a, a small amount of question, but most likely he was Jude, the brother of Jesus. Now, he doesn't say that. In a minute, we're going to read where he refers to himself as the brother of James. And there were basically two Jameses in church history. One is the one we're kind of most familiar with, you know, from Peter and James and John in a sailboat, right? Uh, one of the sons of Zebedee, John, uh, the, the brother of John. And um, he was the one of these two Jameses who did not become an early church leader. But that's only because he is, he is according to biblical record, he was the second official martyr. Uh, not long after the martyrdom of Stephen, James uh, was also martyred. So we're pretty sure we're referring to the other James, which was James, the brother of Jesus. And um, often in the Gospels, when the family of Jesus is referred to, they refer to James in that list, but also a Jude or Judah or Judas. All three of those were different forms of the same name. So we're pretty sure that this was that Jude, because we know from history that he did become a, a leader in the early church, just like his older brother James had done. Um, Jude is writing near the end of his life, and um, I'm a firm believer that the words you write near the end of their life are things that you feel are extremely important. So I believe, and, and I think the text bears out the way he writes, he felt urgently and passionately about the things he writes in this epistle. Uh, and it is not written to any particular group. It is what we refer to as a general epistle. He was writing to the church, to the body of Christ in general, as a whole, rather than to one particular church, as you sometimes read, they'll address it to the church at Philippi or Corinth or wherever. He just addresses this to basically to the body of Christ, to believers. So uh, Jude is sitting down to write, and he has a plan in mind but that plan doesn't go the way he thought it would. So let's start at verse one. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ 
and the brother of James to those who are called, sanctified by God the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ. Mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Uh, as we find in many of the epistles, uh, several of these guys refer to themselves as bond servants. And a bond servant is a little different than a typical slave. A bond servant is a servant or a slave by choice. The word that is translated bond servant refers to someone that had served their appointed time and chose to continue. Now, in Jewish law, every seven years, all sl slaves were freed. So after that seventh year of servitude, seventh year of slavery, they were granted their freedom by Jewish law. Well, a bond servant at that point, the ritual kind of went like this. He would go to his master, tell them that he wanted to continue, and then he would place his ear, the lobe of his ear, in a doorpost, in the doorpost to the house. And the master would take an awl, you know, a puncturing tool, and pierce that ear. Uh, and I assume they put a ring in or something like that to mark him as a servant by choice. He, they generally, you would think of it this way, they realized they had it so good where they were, even as a slave, that to leave would have been crazy. So they continue. So I love that the apostles see themselves this way. They don't put themselves up on a pedestal. They don't refer to themselves as the fathers of the church like we do. They simply saw themselves as voluntary slaves of Christ, that their life was there for him to use as they pleased. Um, and he says that he's writing to those that are sanctified by God. This word sanctified means set apart. This is the same word that was used to describe the utensils that were a part of the tabernacle in the Old Testament. It said they were sanctified. So that meant that it was not just a typical cup or a typical bowl that if you wanted a bowl of cereal, you went just, you know, you got that bowl. No, that bowl was set apart for something special, unique, and holy. And this is the way that he refers to the people he are, he's writing to, that they are separated, that they should be separated from the daily world, from the po profane world that we live in, and set apart and seeing themselves as called uh, for the unique work of God. Um, and he says, sanctified by God the Father and preserved, by, and preserved in Jesus Christ. That word preserved is a Greek word, terio. And I love it because we think of preserve, especially in the South, you know, we think of like fruit preserves. Seriously, we hear the word. That's what, kind of what comes to mind, you know. My grandmother used to take figs. And don't ask me how, but she made them taste just like strawberries. She called them strawberry figs. And, you know, that's the first thing that comes to mind when I hear the word preserve. But when I got into this word, I'm like, you know, I like it. It means that it, it maintains us, you know, but what is it? And when I looked at that Greek word and what it meant, it literally means to guard, to, to put, a, put a, a, a hedge or a sentry around to protect it from injury or from being spoiled. And I love that when we think about the work that Christ has done, it, it doesn't just keep us going, you know, keep us fresh inside the jar. It literally keeps us from being spoiled by the world. And I thought that's, that's such a beautiful picture. And as we often find in many of the greetings, he wishes those he writes to mercy, peace, and love. I love that they do, that all of the epistles, uh, for the most part, include this. And it's always after this preservation, after this position in Christ. And I think that's on purpose, because I think one follows the other. I think when we live in that preserved state, when we seek that state of sanctification, that these things like grace and mercy and peace and love, 
they just naturally follow that place, that position in Christ. Uh, so as we see from those first couple of verses, Jude is writing and he's writing to the entire body. And this is where his plan gets spoiled in verse 3. And he says, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, he wants to write a happy letter. He wants to write about the finished work of Christ and what it does for us and all of this. He wants this really happy, encouraging letter. And then he has to continue, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. So he wanted to write that letter, but the Holy Spirit led him pointedly in another direction. He found it necessary, something he couldn't avoid, to write that they contend earnestly for the faith. Um, that word contend is sometimes translated struggle. It's the word that we, over time, in the English language has turned into the word agonize. So he doesn't just mean casually debate. He doesn't just mean say a word for. He literally means to struggle for the faith, to struggle for the truth of the gospel. Um, for the faith that was once delivered for all to the saints. He's talking about the apostles' doctrine. He's talking about the things taught by Christ and by the apostles. Now, as we've seen in some of the other epistles, uh, it didn't take long in terms of history for heresy, for false teaching, to, to work its way into the church. Um, Satan didn't waste any time trying to corrupt the church. So even less than 100 years in, they're already having to contend for the doctrine. And uh, I find it interesting that as you study these books, uh, like 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, and some of the others, the things that they're contending against, the things that they're standing up against, are the same false teachings that we see today just in different wrapping. Um, as we look through the point uh, tonight in Jude, we will see things that sound very familiar. Things that look like the false teachings of our day. And I, I find it interesting that, that it's, it's never something new. It's just the same old stuff. And um, you would think that we would have gotten over this by now. But we haven't. It, it tends to be the same stuff. So, why do we have to struggle greatly? Why is this protection of, of these early teachings so important? It's because the integrity and the power and the truth of the church is in those teachings. When those teachings slip, the church slips. When those teachings slip, the gospel is weakened. When those teachings slip, the life of the believer is less. So it is extremely important, and Jude understood this, so he found it necessary to write this letter rather than the one that he wrote, wanted to write. Um, also notice that he's not writing to a group of teachers. He's not writing to a group of clergymen. He's writing to everyone sanctified and preserved. So this job of struggling against false teaching, of struggling against uh, the corruption of the gospel, is not solely or even mostly the job of the teacher, of the preacher, of the clergyman. It is the job of the body of Christ in general. The body of Christ as a whole. And Jude is pointing this out. So, why does he feel the need to write this letter? Let's, let's look at verse 4. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men 
who turn the grace of God, grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. All right. So he's, he's, he sees this group of men, this group of teachers who have crept in unnoticed. Uh, it's funny how false teachers, that they don't, they don't walk into the room. They don't get up behind the pulpit and say, I'm about to change everything you believe. You know? They're subtle. They're tricky. They inch it in a bit at a time. They plant a doubt in this area. And then a question in that area. And before you know it, they have twisted the gospel into something that we don't even recognize. Um, they ease their way in to positions of power and authority. Especially in the South, where we have so many churches, and you see some churches that go from pastor to pastor to pastor, and, and, and they, they hire someone, and they're like, yeah, this guy's going to be great. I, you know, looks good, he's got a great reputation, loved it when he came to visit and all of this. And all of a sudden, a little while in, then you begin to see things you didn't see before. And all of a sudden, the teaching has changed just a little bit. And the style of leadership has changed just a little bit. And that first impression begins to wear off. And before you know it, you realize you've got someone in the pulpit that didn't belong there. So they don't come in like that. They come in under the radar and planning a bit of doubt at a time. And before you know it, they've turned the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now in Jude's case in particular, the group of men that he's referring to specifically were known as the Gnostics. And um, we've talked about those guys before in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Uh, but just as a reminder, their basic teaching was that there was this unconnected, un, uh, completely separate dichotomy between what is spirit and what is earthly or what is fleshly. And that the spiritual is completely pure and that the physical is completely evil. And this led to the Gnostics developing into two different groups. One became connected with a, a Roman group known as the Epicureans. And they believed that because the flesh was evil anyway, it really didn't matter what you did with it. You couldn't corrupt it anymore. Your sin, which was a fleshly act, done in the flesh, had no impact because it was done by the part that was pure evil anyway. So their, their idea was, their teaching was that basically it didn't matter how you lived. They turned the gospel into lewdness and they justified this by the grace of God. This flesh that we live in, they said, is, is corrupt anyway. It's going to be corrupt. It's only by the grace of God that, that we have any chance at all. So it doesn't matter what we do. Um, that there are no consequences to sin and that we can live any way we choose. This was their belief. And it's, it's, it's kind of funny. We see a, a variation on that today in, in a group um, of, they call themselves Neo-Calvinist. And, and Neo meaning new. And they're the new variant on the Calvinist uh, belief system. And they take this same philosophy that because of, of predestination, because of the sovereignty of God, if you're chosen, it doesn't matter how you live. And um, they basically, they live that way and believe that every, every little bit of it is completely covered and um, it, it has no effect on them or the world. But 
we know that that's not true because Paul addressed it ex very directly in Romans 6, verses 1 and 2, when he said, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? See, that's exactly the same question he's asking. Does our sin just make God's grace bigger? So just sin to make God's grace bigger. Well, in verse 2 he says, certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Paul understood that the truer glory of God's grace is not just that it covers our sins, but that it frees us from their bondage and their degradation of who we are. And um, it flies completely in the face of this Epicurean belief. Well, the other side of this Gnostic coin were the aesthetics. And they took the same principle that the flesh physical is evil and the spiritual is all good and took it from the, to the other extreme and said, okay, if the flesh is evil and can't be redeemed, it must be our job to do our best to hold it down, to deny it. So they went to great lengths to deny themselves any luxury, any pleasure, sometimes even basic necessities uh, to physically abuse themselves in the name of disciplining this evil flesh. And it developed into a kind of legalism that obviously the grace of God was not yours if you didn't live like this. It was an earning of God's grace. And, and again, just like with the, the Epicurean side, we see this today. We see so many groups that tell you that to get to heaven, you have to toe this line. To be worthy of God's grace, that you have to don't do this, do that, and make sure you don't do that one, right? But we know from a study of the Scripture that God's grace is actually a balance between both. He understands the frailty that we're made in, and His grace does cover it all, but it also frees us from it so that we can, through His power, not through our strength, but through His strength, live above it. Um, Jude, Jude realizes that this is nothing new, even for a young church, and he begins in verse 5. But I want to remind you, though, you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode. He has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire." So Jude is using three historical examples that he knew his, his audience would be familiar with to, to make a comparison to these false teachers and the end result of these. And um, the first were the Israelites as they left Egypt. We all know the story. Moses is leading them. They get to the promised land. And God instructs him to choose spies to enter the land and to, to spy it out, to see what they're up against, to bring back the report. Now, God had already promised that this was their land. That's why they called it the promised land, right? God had already told them, and Moses had already spoken that prophecy. The, the spies knew what God had said. But when they came back, all but two talked about how impossible it was. How there's no way. How these guys will eat us for lunch and kill our children. 
and we as a people will cease to exist if we try to take this land that God has promised. Um, so I, I believe in this section he's, he's making the comparison of unbelief, of a lack of just simple acceptance of what God's Word says. It can't be that simple. We've got to figure out how it's going to work ourselves. And we've got to add our wisdom to what God has said. Um, and that never works. That never works. It not only led to those, those ten spies being left out, but because that disbelief, because those, that way of looking at this promise that we've got to work it out, it permeated the people. And they all took it in. They, they absorbed the, uh, the disbelief, the unbelief. And God told Moses that because of this, they would wander for 40 years in the wilderness without their promised land until that generation had passed away. And the children that they were so worried about would be the ones that would take the land. Uh, the second example he uses. So the first one, the Israelites, he's, he's talking about unbelief, and not believing God's promises and, and the need to feel to do it our own way. The second is, is the angels, the fallen angels. And uh, when, we, when we look at that story, we see the rebellion of Satan, but there were a third of the angels that followed with him. And the, the foundation, the basis of that rebellion was all about putting Satan, putting himself, and by extension these angels, putting themselves in the place of God. Above the word of God. Above the, 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 the position that God naturally held. And by placing themselves there, they are circumventing the natural order of God's work. Now, there is a, a judgment, a very pointed judgment, placed on these angels. And we read it here where he says that he is reserved in everlasting change, un, chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. And when I read that, as I was studying, it's one of those deals where you, you've read things more than once, but all of a sudden you read it a different way and it kind of hits you. So I, I did some digging, and a, a lot of commentators view that phrase where they are, are under darkness for the judgment of the great day. That these, this group of angels is actually being held in a particular part of the underworld awaiting the great tribulation and that they will then be released on the earth and when i read that i got really glad that we won't be here for that because <laughs> if it's as bad as it is now can you imagine what it'll be like when the influence of the Spirit of God and the church is removed and these particular fallen angels are let loose. Uh, I don't want to be there. But anyway, that's a little bit of a rabbit trail, but that kind of hit me there. Um, and, and then the last example he gave was the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And we see a, a, a group of cities, Sodom, Gomorrah, and those around that did something very particular. They placed their physical desire above the Word of God. Uh, these were not strictly heathen. They, they had a knowledge of God, but they made the choice to put their fleshly desires. Now we see that most um, dramatically shown in, in the sexual deviance that was a part of Sodomic culture, but 
um, when you read other references to Sodom, it is, it's clear that that's not the only area. Their, their physical desires in general were placed above any desire to serve or to please God. And it was pervasive. If you remember the story of Lot, when, when they received their judgment, they couldn't even find five. Lot's family had even been corrupted. Even Lot was questionable because he was willing to, to trade his daughters to save the angels. Even Lot was questionable. And it was pervasive in the culture of those towns. And I think we have to embrace that as a warning because sometimes in, in our culture, the church can sometimes bow to, what, to things that become the cultural norm. Uh, how many different Christian denominations now openly not only bring into their congregation but into their pulpits practicing homosexuals? I mean, never mind that, that so much of the body of Christ has, has almost given up on heterosexual purity, but opening the doors to just about anything else. And because it's become the cultural norm. And that's a dangerous place to be. Because as we see with Sodom and Gomorrah, cultures are sometimes judged. And even if it's not a divine judgment, I'm a firm believer that the reason God calls something sin is because it damages us. He, he clearly tells us in His Word that the wages of sin is death. That the long-term consequence of ignoring the things that, that the principles in His Word that the long-term consequences are only one thing, and that is death, physically and spiritually. So I fear for the church. I, I, I honestly, I've, I've reached a point where I no longer fear the effect of the ACLU on the church. Persecute us. We'll get stronger. It's, it, it always happens. The persecuted church gets stronger. What I fear is the degrading of the, stand, the biblical standards within the church. The degrading of the doctrine, of the truth and adherence to biblical standards. So often we stop asking in, in the American church, is it biblical? And we ask, is this, does it feel good? Do we enjoy it? Does it give us goosebumps? Or does it satisfy our intellectual sense of superiority on the other end? When the question should always be, is it biblical? Is it in accordance with the apostles' doctrine? So he makes these three comparisons. And then he begins to, to get back into who these people are, and he starts to define them in terms of the way they live, in, in their character, and the characteristics that they exhibit. And in verses 8 and 9, he says, Likewise, also these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. Yet Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke you. So he says three things here, and then, then gives an example. He says that they reject authority. Um, these false teachers were openly defying 
the leaders of the church. And um, disregarding the authority within the church. And, and we're good at that as Americans, uh, so even if it's subtly. Uh, we, we love to grumble about, about the pastor. Of course, we don't do that around here because we've got a great pastor. Dan, I hope you're listening. Uh, <laughs> but we're good at it as Americans. We love to grumble. We love to, to complain about authority. And, and honestly, I think some of it goes back to our heritage. Uh, it, it's... it's as I'm teaching in school, right now we're in my civics class, we're, we're talking about the influences on American government and we just hit the religious influence and we talked about the Great Awakening. And one, one influence that the Great Awakening had on, uh, on the American government was that the people in then the Great Awakening began to feel comfortable questioning their spiritual leaders. Now, some of that may have been good because some of the religion they brought over from Europe may have been a bit too ritualistic and a a bit too uh, functional over faith, a bit too ritual. But they began to feel comfortable with that. And, And I think that that has become part of the character of the American church, you know, um, that we question the leadership within the church. And I I firmly believe, and again, that's easy around here because we've got a great pastor. He's easy to follow. Um, But I I firmly believe that if you are a member of a church, that it is incumbent upon us as members of a church to support and follow the leadership of the pastor. And if we believe that the pastor is genuinely moving into areas of of heresy or immorality, then we have biblical options. But until that point, we need to follow. But these guys didn't do that. They openly spoke against uh, the leaders of the church, even Peter and Paul. Then he says, speak, uh, and speak evil of dignitaries. Again, they take those that were the leaders, those who were the foundational teachers, and they spoke against them uh, openly. And I love this example of, of how we're to do that, or of how we are to react in those situations. The story of Michael the archangel. Now, uh, in, in some traditions, it's taught that there are a whole class of angels that are called archangels. But really, in the Bible, you only find one angel referred to as an archangel, and that is Michael. And it generally says not an archangel, but the archangel. So it's kind of like he's the general, you know? He's the big cheese among the, the one big cheese among the angels. And when God sent him down to to take care of the body of Moses at his death, uh, Satan fought for that bottle, that body. The devil fought for that body. Uh, Some speculate that he actually wanted to use the body of Moses to create a form of idolatry among the children of Israel because they knew that if they actually had a tomb that they could go to with the body of Moses, that that would become so sacred that it could lead to some form of idolatry. But when the devil came to Michael and and demanded that body, Michael had nothing to say to him but the Lord rebuke you. He didn't call him a dirty, low-down, slew-footed, spike-tailed, horned demon. He didn't take any authority on himself to approach him. He merely said, the Lord rebuke you. And, and I like that. Because honestly, if I am facing something supernatural, 
It's, it's kind of like when you're a kid and the bully has targeted you. You love that day that dad is now standing between you and the bully, right? He may be bigger than you, but he's not bigger than dad. Uh, I don't want to face th this kind of power, this kind of evil on my own, in my power. Uh, and, and Michael felt the same way. His, his response was simply, the Lord rebuke you. But as we continue, but, but as we see these people, they begin to speak against and revile against. At verse 10, but these speak evil of whatever they do not know and whatever they know naturally, like brute beast, in these things they corrupt themselves. This, you know, Jude, Jude must have been Southern. Because he, he just, when it comes time to say it, he just says it. Basically, he's saying... <laughs> They make fun of what they don't know anything about. And the things they do know, they corrupt by the fact that they live so badly. The, the truth of the gospel that they, they don't embrace, they choose to make fun of. They ridicule those who do. But then the things that they get right, their lives are so corrupted that it even spoils that truth. Now, it's about to get serious. Verse 11. He starts out, woe to them. Uh-oh. Here it comes. For they have gone in the way of Cain, have run greedily in the error, error of Balaam for profit, and perished in the rebellion of Korah. Uh-oh. He's comparing them to some pretty serious cases here. Have gone the way of Cain. What was Cain's real sin? What was his real issue? You know, we all know the story of, of the offerings that he and his brother Abel uh, gave to God. And some people teach that the real problem was that, that Cain's offering didn't have blood. Well, the Bible doesn't say that it was a sin offering. And it was only the sin offering that required blood. Uh, the offerings, uh, many other offerings, could take many forms, including grain and, and fruit and vegetables, things grown. Because they were a part of the, the fruit of the labor of a person. So, um, so it's not necessarily that. The, the, the true problem with Cain had more to do with the fact that he became self-serving. That he was more about, the offering even was more about himself than it was about serving God. Um, Cain is the example of a self-serving, proud religion. I'll do it my way. And uh, again, we can't live that way because our way will take us to destruction every time. And then he compares them to Balaam. Balaam have run greedily in the error of Balaam. Balaam tried to do the work of God for his own profit. Uh, the story of Balaam, he was a prophet. As the children of Israel were marching through the land, one of the kings came to the prophet Balaam and asked his help, wanted him to put a curse on them because he knew that he was on their list to be conquered and he wanted them taken care of. And at first, Balaam resisted. But then, the king countered the offer with even more wealth and position. And that was enough to get Balaam's attention. And Balaam began to 
to actively seek to destroy the children of Israel for this king. He knew that he could not prophesy anything that was not the word of God. So we thought of another way. And he told the king, he said, I can't prophesy against them, but if you'll take your most beautiful women, dress them up nice and send them down into the camp, let them get the attention of the men and then have them lead them into the worship of your idols, they will be destroyed. And in Balaam we see the willingness to sacrifice the body of Christ for profit. To twist the gospel into something that it's not to have a big crowd and a big church and a big salary. Greed pulled him from being a prophet to aiding in the downfall of the people of God. And then Korah. Korah was the usurper, the one who wanted the authority and the power for himself. If you remember in uh, Exodus, as uh, Moses is leading the children of Israel out into the wilderness and, and they're setting up the tabernacle and creating the, 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 the God-given processes of worship at that time. And by God's instruction, Aaron is, his brother Aaron, Moses' brother Aaron is placed as the high priest. It was Korah that stood up and said, well, why Aaron? I'm same tribe as Aaron. Why can't it be me? I want to do that. And Korah and those that followed him uh, were, were dealt with very harshly. Uh, the Lord literally opened the earth and swallowed them up. Uh, so we see that, that idea of submitting to the authority of those people that God has placed in authority as being something very serious. Okay, he continues. He's not done with them yet. He's through with examples. He's back to talking about their character again. In verse 12, he says, These are spots in your love feast. While they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves, they are clouds without water, carried about by the winds, late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame, wandering stars, for whom is reserved the blackness and darkness forever. Um, when, when he refers to them, them being a part of the love feast, being spots on the love feast, uh, the, the early church actually did communion differently than we do. They called it a love feast. It wasn't just a, a bit of bread and, and a cup of wine or, or juice. They literally feasted. And the process was a part of that feast. And uh, Jude is describing these people as being spots on it, as being blemishes, as damaging the, the atmosphere and, and the spiritual value of the love feast. But why? While they feast with you without fear, with what they're teaching, they should be afraid to even be a part of this. And serving only themselves. They were only there to feed. They, um, they made sure they got theirs in the process, you might say. When, uh, when I think of this, I kind of think of a teenage boy. You know, whenever the church has a dinner. First one's always in line to the teenage boys, right? Because they've got that appetite. 
But a, a teacher of the word should know better than that. They should let people uh, go first. They should serve others. But these were here only to serve themselves. These next few, if, if these things were ever said about me, I think it would kill me. They are clouds without water. Now, in a desert culture that depended on agriculture, rain meant something. Um... Uh, one of my favorite songwriters once wrote the line, rain can ruin your weekend or rain can save your life, depending on who you are and what your thirst is like. And in this culture, rain was everything. Because if it didn't rain, animals died, crops didn't grow, it meant something. So to be called a, rain, a cloud without water, that's an insult. That's all promise and no fulfillment. Or as my grandfather used to say, it's all show and no go. But eventually, I reached a point where I began, as I got older, I began to study the Word, and I began to long for the meat of the Word. And I remember sitting here thinking one Sunday, because I kept going to that church because of Mom. You know, you do a lot of things for mom. I kept going to that church for mom, but one Sunday I just thought, man, if you're going to yell at me, yell something. You know, yell something of meaning. And, and don't be a cloud with no water. Don't be all promise, all show, but no substance. If they were late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots. This is similar. So much work. It's time for the harvest. You should see fruit from their ministry, but it's not there. The kind of tree you want to just pull up and burn because all it's doing is wasting space on your land. Raging waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame. Apparently, they like to preach and teach loudly also. But all it did was increase the shame of their lack of fruit and lack of substance. Here's another one that really hit me. Wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Um, back in these days when they traveled, the stars were their guide. And that only worked because stars were constant. You knew where this star would be on this day of the year. And because you knew where this star would be on this day of the year, you knew the direction you were going. But a wandering star is not something you can follow. It has no value. Verses, verse 14. Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men, also saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Do you think that he thought these guys were ungodly? He, he, he kind of made that clear, right? Um, even as long ago as Enoch, it was known, it was prophesied that these type of teachers would come, but also what their end would be and that it wouldn't be a profitable thing for them. Verse 16, he keeps going. This list keeps getting longer. These are grumblers, complainers, walking according to their own lust, and they mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. They were grumblers. They were complainers. They were the ones that brought dissensions and splits in the body of Christ. But at the same time, they were flatterers. 
They knew who to rub the right way to get what they wanted, to get an advantage. Verse 17. But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. How they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lust. These are sensual persons who cause divisions, not having the spirit. Uh, mockers. It's, it's funny how false teachers uh, always seem to end up mocking the truth. Uh, making fun of it, making fun of the truth of Scripture and of those who believe it and end up causing divisions in the body of Christ. Now, up to this point, this has been a pretty hard letter. And apparently, as he tells us at the beginning, Jude felt the need for this. He's been very pointed about who these teachers are and what is ahead for them. But here in verse 20, he begins to turn his attention to the body. How do we maintain in the face of this kind of onslaught of false teaching? And in verse 20, it says, But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. So here's his plan. Here's what he says. Okay, how do you protect yourself from this? How do you maintain your spiritual life in the face of all of this? First, he says to build yourselves up in the most holy faith. How do we do that? How do we build that up? It's, it's as simple but as difficult as living in the Word of God. Um, I once heard someone asked, how much, how much of the Bible should I read on a daily basis? What's a good amount? And his answer was, more. If you don't spend time in the Word yet on a daily basis, five minutes is better. If you spend 15 minutes in the Word, try 20. If your daily reading takes a half hour, shoot for an hour. More. Build yourselves up. Because that's where we find that gospel. That's where we find, that's where we reignite in ourselves that apostle's doctrine by staying in the Word. And let the Word guide, be the guiding force in our lives and in our behavior. Then he said, praying in the Holy Spirit. Um, you know, it's funny, prayer so many times for us, again, especially in American culture, is, is basically sending our, our wish list to Santa Claus. It becomes a list of things we want God to do. God bless them, God heal them, Lord, I need this. Boom. And, and I don't think that's what prayer is designed to be. And I don't think that's what he means by praying in the Spirit. Um, during my, my mission years in, in one of my training schools, we actually had a week where we trained on praying. And there was this, this pattern. And one of the hardest parts for me and, and everyone else I talked to about it was that step at the beginning where you just got silent. Where you asked God, what do you want me to pray? What do you, Holy Spirit, want me to pray? But after a while, it became so empowering. It became powerful because you began to pray about things in a different way. It wasn't just the simple basic, oh, this person needs this, God, give it to them. It began to grow, and you felt the Holy Spirit 
begin to pray through you. It is allowing the Holy Spirit to teach us how to commune with God because prayer in its truest form is us visiting with Dad. Now, when I think Dad, I think of my grandfather because he, I grew up in his home and, and he really held the place of Dad in my life. And I remember I, I, I would do things I didn't want to do just to kind of hang out with him because he was Papa, and Papa was cool, you know? I, 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 I'm a typical Southern guy in so many ways, but sports is just lost on me. But Papa loved the Tigers. And I was eight, nine, 10, I would watch the Tigers, even though I really wanted to watch cartoons. But I would watch the Tigers with Papa because I was with Papa. And that's what prayer should be like. We're with Dad. We're with Abba. And prayer should become a communion with Him when we pray in the Spirit. Keeping ourselves in the love of God. Now, this doesn't mean that we can mess up and lose the love of God. I think what he's saying is here is keep ourselves aware of the fact that that, that love is there. That that love surrounds us. And honestly, I feel like, and I'll go ahead and disclaimer here, maybe this is because I'm a worship leader, but I think that is the place of worship. I, I, I draw a distinction between praise and worship, and I think both have a, an amazing amount of value. There is something inspiring and faith-filling about singing or, or even speaking the, the, the nature and character of God, and that is praise. But there's something totally different where basically you crawl up into daddy's lap and just love him. And that is worship. And I think that's the place that worship has to keep us in that love. And looking for the mercy of our God, excuse me, of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Learning to appropriately live in the grace of God. Not taking advantage of the grace of God, not feeling, not ignoring the grace of God, saying we have to earn it, but understanding being able to live in that grace. Verse 22, and on some have compassion, making a distinction, but others say with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. Now he's talking about reaching out to those false teachers. And he teaches us a good lesson here. Not everybody responds the same way. Uh, some people are drawn to the Lord through loving compassion. And me, on the other hand, okay, this is on video, so I won't say that. Uh, <laughs> me, on the other hand, I had to have the devil scared out of me. You know, because I grew up in church and I was in this meeting where it was 666 is already on this building and these playing cards. And the U.S. Postal, they used to have a, uh, the, the eagle symbol. If you looked at it close enough, you could see 666 in there. And that guy scared me to death. But it worked. And, but for others, loving compassion draws them. And I, I think what Jude is saying there is that measure who you're with and give them the gospel they need. And then finally, he ends with one of, to me, one of the most beautiful benedictions in Scripture. In verse 24 and 25, he says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be the glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. I love that line, able to keep us from stumbling. We're back to that uh, preserving, to present us faultless. Man, I give him a lot of work if that's the case, if he's going to present me faultless. Um, and, and the thing is, is it's, it's, it's not a get to heaven by the skin of our teeth thing. He presents us faultless because of his work. And he does it with exceeding joy. It gives God pleasure to do those things and to see us that way. 
And who does he present us to? To his Father, to our Father, to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty and dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you would help us, Lord, to contend for the faith in our daily lives on a on a one-to-one basis as we walk through our life that we would contend for the faith, for your, your gospel, Father. But Lord, even more, uh, well, maybe not more, but Father, just as important that we would stand up in the community of believers and contend for that faith. To not be satisfied, to see it wither and to see it be watered down, uh, Father. But Lord, that we would stand strong in your word, on your word, Father, we thank you that you don't leave us where we are, Father, but that you embrace us. Lord, you preserve us. You keep us from stumbling. Lord, you see us faultless thanks to the work of your Son. And Lord, that it gives you such great joy to bring us in and to be presented to your Father. Lord, we pray that you're with us as we leave. We pray that we would take these, the words that you have spoken to our hearts tonight with us. And Lord, that we would be different.